Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast. We're now moving on to the other game from last night in terms of NBA playoffs from Wednesday night. And we saw the Boston Celtics dismantle the Miami Heat to win the game big, end up closing out the series 4-1, to one, and they are now moving on to the second round, the first team in the Eastern Conference to clinch their spot in the second round. And the Heat really never put up a fight in this one, and obviously injuries are the number one conversation surrounding the Heat, missing Jimmy Butler, missing Terry Rozier, uh, Josh Richardson as well. I feel like I always sort of throw him in as this like other tier of player that's missing but Josh Richardson is a real piece for them and then on top of all of this Jaime Hawkes Jr. was ruled out for this game he left late in game four with a hip injury he wasn't able to come back in this one so the Celtics really just took it to the heat in this game had it in the palm of their hand the whole time they took a double digit lead at 311 and didn't look back from there it was Derek White hitting the shot to get them to double digits at that point he had another big time first quarter, scored 15, and he has just been massively important for them this season. If I can take a minute to sort of talk about the level of production that he's giving them, because the fact that he now is sort of secure in his role last year was definitely weird with the dynamic that was taking place in Boston, considering the fact that there was a lot of things. White wasn't necessarily a proven veteran up to this point yet even though we saw the flashes with him and I thought that he was the third best Celtic on the team last year but specifically from a coaching standpoint with Joe Mazzula who was sort of thrown into the fire given all of the Ime Udoka drama in the offseason Mazzula steps in as a first-time head coach who wasn't expecting to be in the role and I think that the players sort of knew that as well, at least at the time. I feel like they've grown to respect him a lot more during the course of this season. But at least for last year, you know, it felt like Marcus Smart, it, who was obviously, you know, the heart and soul of that Celtics team. He was the longest tenured Celtic, basically, period. Longest tenured player. And he actually preceded Brad Stevens when he began in Boston. Stevens was the head coach of the team for a handful of years, ended up being GM, uh, being promoted to GM a couple years ago. And that was all during the time span that Marcus Smart was a Celtic. So I feel like for Missoula, it was very tough for him to sort of confront Marcus Smart like that and sit him in some of these big moments in favor of Derek White. Now, I'm not fully defending it necessarily, and you know Marcus Smart was obviously still a very impactful player, so it's also not an indictment of Marcus Smart. That's just how I've felt about Derek White. And now that he is definitive in his role, feels like he has just this level of confidence where he's willing to let it rip more offensively. It's what we've seen at least in the first quarter of these past couple games to help lead a couple blowouts. And now I just feel like he is fully unlocked and you can make the argument that he was the best Celtic in this series. It was either him or Jason Tatum. Um, I don't really care enough to debate that, but it... You know, it's a real conversation because that's how good Derek White was in this series. But ultimately, when you look at this game and the series as a whole, Celtics had no excuse to lose. Obviously, with all of the injuries that Miami was dealing with, and they just had no real form of offense other than Bam Adebayo. And I love Bam. I feel like he goes underappreciated by a lot of NBA fans. But his offense isn't really one that can you know, put a playoff team on its shoulders to duel against one of the best offensive teams in the league in a playoff situation, especially when you don't have the spacing around him. The Heat hit just three threes in comparison to the Celtics 16. They didn't really have a, cho a, a chance in this one to that perspective. This was a tough game for Tyler Hero, where, you know, Hero is somebody that I'm really interested in, both you know, sort of going forward as well, I feel like his evaluation is a really tough one because he does provide a level of offense that 
the Heat definitely need, and it was clear that they were missing him when the rest of their team was healthy and their offense still wasn't great. But, you know, the offense at times, and he did showcase some of the playmaking ability that he maybe has. He's still not a traditional point guard, but with a traditional point guard next to him, he can be maybe a little bit of a combo guard. Not saying quite as good, but maybe sort of a similar role um, downsized a bit though to what Devin Booker does for the Suns and but the issue for Tyler Hero in this game was the fact that the Celtics were time after time attacking him defensively and he wasn't getting any types of stops Jason Tatum specifically was absolutely loving that matchup but really it was the whole team that was going in on him and it just, it was a pretty bad performance from him there. I know that he got a couple easy layups mid second quarter that does sort of boost up the stats a little bit, but just didn't think it was a good Tyler Hero game. And the Heat's offseason is just going to be very interesting moving forward here because a lot of basketball fans are arguing that if the Heat had Jimmy Butler, they would easily win this series. I just don't know about that. Celtics won by 20 points, 20 points, 14 points, and 34 points in their wins. The series definitely has a different energy to it if Jimmy Butler is available for the Heat, but I still think the Celtics win. Now, maybe the Heat steal another game along the road here, but at least from the perspective of a Celtics fan, if the Heat decided to run it back with the exact same team, both teams fully healthy... I would be on board for that because I think the Celtics would win. So in terms of looking ahead at their offseason, I'd prefer that they choose not to do all too much because I just feel like that offense was flawed all season long. And obviously we know that Jimmy Butler doesn't necessarily care about the regular season. We're going to get into that as this segment moves on here. But the Heat were bottom 10 in the league in offensive rating this season. The only time they topped 100 points in this series was when they shot a franchise record 23 of 43 from three in game two. And they're going to, in my eyes, at least need to address something. Now, again, they never really got the full version of themselves with Rozier, Hero, Butler, Adebayo, of course, and sort of the rest of the group. And it does feel like they have some level of depth, but at the same time, just doesn't feel like that's enough offensively, at least in my eyes. And for their offseason plans, it's going to be interesting considering the fact that Jimmy Butler is eligible for a contract extension. He is reportedly seeking a max extension from the Heat this offseason. According to the Miami Herald, he is hoping to get a $113 million max extension over the next two seasons. So we'll see about that. But... He has a he's locked in for next season and then the 2025-26 season he has a player option that he will likely decline unless anything crazy occurs there that's assuming he even gets there and they don't work out in extension this offseason we'll see about all of that and I think that Butler is going to get that contract extension now there are some points you could make as to why he shouldn't get that type of money. He's going to be 35 years old next season. He hasn't played in 65 or more regular season games since the 2018-19 season. This past season, he had his worst averages in assists, rebounds, and steals since he joined the Heat. His scoring numbers dipped as well from the 2022-23 season. And he seems to almost be celebrated and praised by a lot of NBA fans, at least during the regular season. I feel like now that the Heat are in this sort of position, more fans are turning on him. But it feels like, uh, for a lot of the year at least, it's almost cool that he doesn't care about the regular season or winning any types of awards along those lines. But the Heat have now been 8 si eight seeds in each of the past two postseasons which is just not a recipe for success they were trailing late in the fourth quarter of the game last year that they played against the Chicago Bulls and almost missed the playoffs altogether now of course 
a little bit overstated. I feel like I myself have at least said it a bunch of times, but it's just a fact that the team that made the NBA Finals almost didn't even make the playoffs, which is, of course, you know, remarkable the way that they did pull off that run once they made it to the playoffs, but they didn't make it easy for themselves is what I'm saying, and that they didn't make them it's it easy for themselves this year either where you can't really bank on knocking off the number 1 seed in the first round every single year that's just not really a recipe for success and you know even when you look at this year he doesn't care as much about the regular season he's just focused on the postseason it's not like he saved himself any sort of injury by not caring about the regular season because he of course freak injury but he gets injured in the play-in game, an extra game that he wouldn't have had to play if the Heat were able to get the sixth seed or higher, and he ends up missing the playoffs altogether. And I like Jimmy Butler a lot. You have to respect him. His story is absolutely incredible. If you haven't looked into it, you definitely should. It is a great one. And you have to respect the type of player he is, but at the same time, you know, the Heat could use him stepping up more in the regular season and I would argue it's harming them that he isn't. Now, he's not the sole issue. Again, I feel like there are other things on the roster that need to be improved, and maybe it's just a fact of they need to be all be healthy together to actually develop some chemistry, but that I, I'm just not sure. That offense was really broken this regular season, and I'm just not sure that they can sort of flip a switch in the postseason. Jimmy averaged whatever it was, like 35, 40 points in the first round last year against a Bucks team that, granted, hardly had Giannis in the series, and that's great. And they did ultimately steamroll their way. I wouldn't say steamroll, but made their way to the NBA Finals, but then they're relying on Caleb Martin, who probably hasn't averaged 20 points per game since he was in high school him doing that in the conference finals. And again, I'm not trying to diminish the heat by any means, but I feel like they sort of are going to have a lot of questions this offseason is really what I am getting at. But I guess final, and again, I think that the Heat are going to re-sign Jimmy Butler. I just wanted to kind of lay out the cases for some of the concerns that could be surrounding this type of a move, but I think they will do it and I think they should do it. But kind of last notes here on the game itself. I thought that Al Horford played really well in replacement of Kristaps Porzingis, who of course went down in game four with that calf injury. Um, Porzingis is going to be out for some time, so they were going to have to rely on an older Al Horford. They ended up playing some Luke Cornette minutes as well, who he had sort of fallen out of the rotation. I thought that he did a pretty good job himself. I feel like I'm personally higher on Xavier Tillman as a you know bench big option, but Cornette did nothing wrong necessarily to prove that he wasn't worthy of those minutes, and they're both fine options off of the bottom of the bench, but it's going to be interesting to see how the Celtics choose to manage Al Horford's minutes, considering the fact that he is 37 years old. He is 38 at the beginning of June, so if they were to make it to the NBA Finals, he's going to be 38 by then. He has a lot of miles under his sort of career here, especially in the playoffs the past few years. The Celtics have been very reliant on him, and they put up a stat, I think it was it was either last night or it was during Game 4, but Al Horford now has the second most playoff games played from any active NBA player, only behind LeBron James. So um, that's sort of all I have on the Game 5. Quickly here, for the Celtics moving forward, a lot of Celtics fans are taking some victory laps over this series, and I get it. This has been a pretty contentious rivalry, even though times both sides of the rivalry, at least on Twitter, and Twitter is obviously a nightmare, but uh, you have um, people sort of denying that it is a rivalry, but it, it, it is. They've met in four of the last five playoffs, met in the Eastern Conference Finals three times. The Heat fans were chanting, we want Boston during their play-in win over the Chicago Bulls, but for the Celtics here, Things only really could have gone wrong for them, and some Celtics fans will be upset with that, but that's the reality when your expectations are as high as they are. It's almost a privilege to 
you know, not be able to celebrate a first round series. And you can be happy about it, absolutely, especially when it comes to beating the Miami Heat because of this rivalry. But I feel like a lot of Celtics fans are sort of getting ahead of themselves, saying that Missoula outcoached Eric Spolstra. I'm not willing to go that far. Um, the talent discrepancy has always sort of been in favor of the Celtics, but it's never been a margin wider than it was during this postseason. And I just feel like I'm not ready to say that Missoula did a better job than Eric Spolstra. I just feel like a message to my fellow Celtics fans, enjoy the series win. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, but you know, we can, we, again, we can enjoy it. It's fun to beat the Heat, but at the same time, there are bigger things at stake here. And on that note, for the Celtics moving forward, we talked about it briefly here. Kristaps Porzingis may miss the entire second round. We don't know who they're going to be playing yet. Cavs Magic Game 6 is on Friday night. If the Cavs win that one, the Celtics will play them on Sunday. If the Magic win and this goes to seven, the Celtics will play the winner of that on Tuesday. Celtics probably would like the the other Eastern Conference series to go as long as possible to give Porzingis the maximum amount of time. But I do think that the Celtics can beat either Orlando or Cleveland without Porzingis. I do think that the matchup against Cleveland is a little more interesting with the two bigs that there are there. That size might be a little bit of an issue, but I would still take the Celtics in that series. And then finally here, Tatum didn't have the most outstanding series and he's one of the less popular NBA stars when it comes to, at least on Twitter. And a lot of people are sort of looking at his shooting splits of 42-29 and acting like it was this terrible performance from him. The Heat were throwing everything they could defensively at Tatum, and I thought it was interesting. There's this clip that's sort of circulating that in December, Jason Tatum went on Andre Iguodala's podcast, Point Forward, and Iguodala talked about during his couple seasons that he spent with Miami, it was in 2019-20, um around those years that the Heat have a very in-depth game plan for Jason Tatum specifically. He referred to it as the Tatum rules similar to the Pistons Jordan rules. Those were his words, not mine. Don't get mad at me for trying to make some sort of comparison that I'm not. That the Heat studied Tatum's habits down to some of these small details of what he does after three dribbles or what he likes to do when the shot clock shot clock is at 15 seconds or second seven seconds and they have really just sort of poured themselves into stop Jason Tatum figure out the rest and I just think that even though the personnel for some of these other teams are is going to be better as the playoffs progress here from a game plan standpoint the Heat sort of know what to do in order to slow down Jason Tatum and I thought that they did so, but I think that Tatum's only going to get more efficient from here. We'll see how it goes. That's at least my prediction as things currently stand, but we will have to see about that. But that is all I have on this series. We're now going to be taking our second break of the show. And when we come back, I want to switch gears a little bit to the NFL. And I specifically want to talk about the NFC North and the draft that they had over last weekend. So stick with us. We will be right back. <laughs> 